Hey, you're listening to the Words on Flick show with me, Janine Coveney. You're listening to the Words on Flick show on E-Water Radio. K-E-W-R-D-B. The views and comments expressed do not reflect the opinions of Blue Water Radio. All comments and views are show guest views and comments and in no way reflect views or comments of Blue Water Radio, K-E-W-R-D-B, or its opinions. Welcome, Words on Flex fans and friends, to the December 2023 edition of the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a great show for you with three very special guests to talk about some of the biggest films of the year. And let me tell you a little bit more about them. My first guest is Anita M. Samuels. Anita M. Samuels is a nationally acclaimed journalist and critic who writes about media, fashion, music, and culture. Samuels has been an editor for national publications, including BET Weekend, Billboard, Heart and Soul, Impact Radio, Records, and Retail Weekly. Her stories have appeared in Essence, The Source, Consumer Digest, Global Rhythm Magazine, The Asbury Park Press, Upscale, Honey, Code, Caribbean Forum, Child Magazine, Fierce for Black Women, and DiverseBusinessNews.com, among others others. She's also the author of Rants and Retorts, How Bigots Got a Monopoly on Commenting About News Online. All right, my girl Anita. And you should be familiar with my brother, A. Scott Galloway. He's a prolific Los Angeles-based music journalist who has been writing about music since 1988 for magazines that include Urban Network, Wax Poetics, and the UK's Blues and Soul interviewing artists from Max Roach to Maxwell. His specialty niche is composing liner notes essays for reissues and compilations of classic recordings for which he has written more than 300. Then we have Derek Thompson. He is a previous guest on the podcast. Derek is a writer, director, and producer who co-founded Nailbiter Productions, a company specializing in digital and original scripted television content. The company's first web series, Romp, is currently available for viewing on YouTube. Thompson's background is in the music industry with stints at both Def Jam and EMI, working with the likes of LL Cool J and Arrested Development. Eventually, Derek found his way to the newly formed, the then newly formed BMG Music Publishing, where he eventually became senior vice president of talent and oversaw the company's expounding, the company's expanding R&B hip hop roster. During his successful tenure at BMG, he brought the likes of Mob Deep, Nelly, Erica Badu, and Lupe Fiasco into the BMG Music Publishing family. He is a big fan of movies, as we all are, so I hope you enjoy our wide-ranging conversation. Thanks for listening. Yes. Yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, here we are. Welcome to the Words on Flick show. I've got a great panel here today to talk about some of our favorite films of 2023. But really, this is just an excuse for us to really go in deep on one of my favorite films of the year, and it probably is yours, which is American Fiction, which is just coming to theaters. Um, It's coming into theaters in uh, major cities. It just came out this past weekend, and it's going to go wide in the coming week. So welcome, journalist Anita M. Samuels. And we have... Say hi, Anita. Hello. How is everybody? (laughs) (laughs) And then I have my friend and a long-esteemed colleague, Mr. A. Scott Galloway from Los Angeles, who's been on the show. Welcome, Scott. Hello, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you, Nini. 
And then, of course, I have my other longtime friend and associate and music industry colleague who is now a writer and content creator, Mr. Derek Thompson. Thanks for coming back, Derek. Happy holidays to everybody. Awesome. So I am going to dive right in because I think this is the picture. This is the flick that everybody's going to be talking about. It's going to make a big impact, we hope and pray, and maybe get some awards um, recognition for the actors. And that is the film American Fiction, directed by Cord Jefferson. This is his first time directing his own script. It's an adaptation of the Percival Everett novel, choking, the Percival Everett novel Erasure. And Percival Everett is a novelist I happen to love. And he he has a unique writing approach. So he often uses satire and a bit of the absurd to make his points. So where do we begin? Scott, <laughs> you just saw it yesterday. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I saw it in a, a, a theater in Burbank. And uh, oh, my goodness. I mean, everybody... Uh, was very enthralled with it. Uh, it was a uh, probably about half full house on a Saturday afternoon. I, I, all I can say is, is wow. You know, I love the casting. I love the story. I love the layered depth of relationships, family, uh, love, romances. Um, I, I, of course, the, the main part of it is, uh, you know, they're writing this book. <laughs> after writing a lot of wonderful pieces that didn't really get much attention or sales. And he, you know, we know the story. He he writes a book that just pandered to the lowest common denominator and, you know, it just becomes a sensation and, and he's appalled. Right. <laughs> he was trying it's to it's proving his point, right. That, you know, black trauma porn is what is really selling in the publishing market. And so he writes this completely ridiculous stereotypical book and it blows yeah. up which is something, well, which is something all of yes. us can relate to <laughs> as writers right we're all writing in the current uh you know atmosphere landscape of you know the the, the media world and we're all struggling to the, with this in on certain levels right oh yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, for me, I, I I don't do fiction, so I don't have the the same uh, issues that uh, that he had. But I certainly see it in uh, in the in the music world, you know, just in you know the kind of records that are uh, really popular versus some really great things that don't get attention. So it kind of uh, even though this is dealing with uh, the literary world, it, it's something that we see, you know, you know, across the board as far as the pandering and and. Um, you know, whatever is easiest for a mass audience to digest. Right, right. So, Anita, you've seen it twice, I believe. No, I actually didn't get to see it a second time. Okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's definitely a topic that Black academics and Black journalists struggle with on a daily basis. I know how I have. Mm -hmm. I don't write about the negative Black aspects of our lives. I read about the most positive things that I can find and mostly to educate and to teach not just other people but also myself because there's so much that we don't know mm -hmm. you know about ourselves so that's why I try to do that but I like the film and the theater that I was in I would say that the group was about was more white than black here in Park Slope Brooklyn and every time it got mm -hmm. to a scene where you know, it was laughable. I was kind of cringing a little bit because I'm like, okay, okay. Why are they laughing? Why are they laughing? And we know okay why we're laughing. Laughing, why exactly. <laughs> I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Was it that funny? Was it mm. that funny when he was writing, you know, and the characters are appearing and he's writing it and they're acting out what he's writing? Was it that funny or was it kind of scary? Like, um, wow, this is how we're viewed. Yeah. So, yeah, that was so yeah. real. The very little part of the film is, is him writing and then the characters are right there in the room with him and asking him what their next lines are. It's like, 
I'd never seen that before. That was kind of a new device for me. I don't know if you guys have seen that. No, it was. And I read something in the Times about saying that he didn't want to keep it going. He just wanted that small part and he ended it there. And we never saw any more of that than, you yeah, know, not in the, in the images. Yeah. 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 But back to Scott talking about how you don't write fiction necessarily, but um, Cord Jefferson used to be a journalist. And yeah. in wow. his there was a uh, a huge press conference that I was privy to online where they had the like the, almost the entire cast on stage, including Cord mm. Jefferson. And Cord was talking about how he got out of journalism because every time there was a shooting, a kill, a police uh, killing of a black person, uh, at some kind of tra tragedy involving black people, they were like here the, here's your assignment here's your story can you write this up for us can you write this up for us and he he just said i just got tired of being the go-to person for black trauma news and yeah. you know that is something that i'm sure is relatable to anybody who has had to do news i mean you we've done music so maybe that's not yeah. but if somebody dies you know and you know there you go it's like I we're trying to write about it I think that um, uh, we just have a tendency in this country to like categorize and pigeonhole things. And that's what this really spoke to me about. Um, first of all, thank you, Janine, because I had a l wonderful seat uh, at the New York screening and I had no idea that Corey Jefferson and the entire cast were gonna be there. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> I thought I was just going to a random screening and I pull up and there's like barricades and limousines and I'm like, what is going on here? Um, but anyway, I just want to say, uh, jump around, and say a couple things. Um, first of all, I'm so happy to see uh, Jeffrey Wright give flowers. Jeffrey Wright has been putting in the work for decades. Yes, and has always been yes, underrated, has. and I cannot imagine anybody else playing this role. I thought he it was fantastic um, from uh, beginning to end. And I thought my takeaway was I thought it was a perfect um, uh, blending and script wise blending of kind of silliness meets seriousness. I thought like the, the, the making of the book thing was the the book, um, the fake book was kind of like the silly part, but the dynamics in the family yes. and mm -hmm. like the, mo the mother getting older and not being there. And then, and then um, uh, Jeffrey Wright's character, you know, he didn't even know that his dad was having an affair because he had taken himself out of the loop and he had become a, an outsider and it was his fault. He didn't know what was going on. Um, and so I thought that was great. And then I thought the dynamic of the Sterling K. Brown character was um, hilarious. And I thought that one of the surprising scenes, which because you asked us earlier uh, about our two favorite scenes, and yeah. one of mine was the reaction that Lorraine and Maynard, who are getting married, how they, they are very accepting when yeah. they come into the house. Mm -hmm. Like you would think that they were going to be like completely like go off and be like, what is going on here? Get him out of here. But they were the accepting ones. And and um, Jeffrey Wright's character was the one that was like, I can't I can't deal with this. And I thought that was a great dynamic. It was it, really a powerful movie. It is but such a powerful a whole movie. Lot I say about family in this movie. Yeah. That's all I have to say. I mean, I mean, the family aspects were just, you know, that that's a that's a TV series I could probably watch. You know, I mean, I was really yeah. into all of those characters, man. It was it was great. Yeah. And just seeing Leslie Uggams, um, yeah. you know, um, who is yeah. a legend. I mean, just yes. the casting of the entire film. Um, you know, um, when they received the script, and I don't know if they talked about this in the in the um, the session, the talk session that you saw, Derek. But they were saying that when they first got the script, it was actually called the second title of the book. <laughs> That starts with F. Oh wow! No, <laughs> That's what the that. script wow. was called. And they were wow. like, you know, um, and they were, uh, yeah, they yeah. were like, what is this going to be? But also the family dynamics, you know, with Tracy mm -hmm. Ellis Ross as the sister who was bearing the brunt of mm -hmm. what was going on with their aging mm -hmm. parent. We all are in that sandwich generation mm -hmm. of dealing with older parents and they're in various stages, um, burying the ones we love, the sibling dynamic of joshing each other. But what I also loved was the love between 
the two older characters who actually yeah. got married. That was yeah. like, yeah. how often do we so see cool. that? Yeah. That was yeah. amazing. Yeah. When Maynard rolled out and he was like, low rain, I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he's in love. his feelings. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it rekindled yeah. old love that that they, that got a second chance, and uh, they didn't waste a second. They got they hooked right up, and uh, that was beautiful. So many, just like I said, such a layered, so many things going on in that movie, and we gotta be careful of spoilers. But yeah, it's just, it was oh, yeah. so wonderful. I can't. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't, I don't, want, I don't oh. want to spoil anything either. But uh, like Anita, I too want to see. I need to see it again because my other favorite scene is the scene um, at the authors, when the authors are in the jury, and it's the scene between Issa and Jeffrey. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. scene is so powerful. It and I really, really want to see, is. I really want to see line by line what they said, because I forgot, I mean, I, know, I got the gist of it, but I forget some of the uh, some of the specific lines they said, because those lines were biting and cutting, because we as the audience, we know that those, uh, that both those books are really full of crap. And Jeffrey Wright knows that his book is full of crap, but Issa really thinks that she had, her character thinks that she really put in the work, even though, you know, her book is kind of full of it as well. But that dynamic, that back and forth between the two of them was my other favorite scene in the whole movie. I have she to did agree recently. with you. Yeah. That, that to me was, okay, so we have these two stories side by side. We have the family story of what mm -hmm. Thelonious Ellison is going through. And then we have this publishing story. And mm -hmm. that to me, that scene with the two of them, the only two black writers on- Two black this, writers. Mm -hmm. Right, on this jury of judging literary work for the year, that is a really pivotal scene because, and Cord Jefferson even said he did not want to vilify- He's um, right. Issa, Issa's exactly. character exactly. or other writers, yeah. you know, who are out here doing their thing. Like they yeah. have audiences. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. It is a legitimate genre of literature. And she's like, yeah, I did the work. I defend it. I stand. It's not that it isn't real. And Thelonious is like, you know, mom is like, I just don't want people to think that's all we are. So very, we, very li we lives in the ghetto. <laughs> we, we, we's, we's, we's lived in the ghetto oh yeah. my god Denise, I have to tell you though I really was surprised that they when they were sitting in the room together I was like okay they're going to be agreeing with each other or something like that I fully did not expect the way that it ended up working out and I thought right. that was really interesting because I right. just assumed oh they'll get, this, get together and be like oh yeah 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 we can agree with this and that they did not they were polar opposites and it's like mm -hmm. you know no Ooh. and I thought too because she was a woman I thought that was really interesting mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. she was able to on her own speak mm -hmm. her piece exactly. as a black female author exactly exactly and not only that she was the only person speaking sense in a way within that entire jury right she right. to to monk surprise is really the voice of reason in that whole process right <laughs> yes, yes so that part was interesting but let, really, let me just oh, go ahead Derek. go ahead i was gonna say just real quickly it's really hilarious and again not to give away too much but when they announced that he's won her reaction is so priceless to me because she is like this mm -hmm, oh my god <laughs> Right. <laughs> I, I know. I know. But let, let me just roll back for a minute because, again, this movie is packed with so much and it does um, merit, you know, multiple viewings. Definitely. And mm -hmm. I think for those of us, it, you know, whatever realm that you're in and whatever your experience is, you can pull something out of it. But, but here, that the fact that the main character is an academic and a writer. So will everyone understand that his very name has historical um, impact, right? Like his name yeah. is yeah. Thelonious Ellison, paying tribute yep. to the jazz great Thelonious Monk, who was one of the most influential jazz component, co composers and pianists ever. And that's that's why he has the same um, 
you know, uh, nickname Monkey, right? They call mm-hmm. Monk. Monk. Yeah, Monkey. And Monk. Ralph Ellison, the African American writer who wrote the classic 1952 novel *The Invisible Man*, which for which he became the first Black person to win the National Book Award. So. Wow. Mm-hmm. You know, people might hear the name and think it's familiar. For other people, they won't get the references. I mean, you know, we know our generations, our younger people might not get it. Mm-hmm. And then the yeah. other thing that Anita reminded me of, but I, I did know, is the fact that Monk uses a specific pseudonym, right? Stag yes. R. Stag Lee. Stag R. Lee, right. Stag right. Lee. Yeah. So... <laughs> Anita, we were looking up who Stagger Lee is the other day. So right, right, the song baked from uh, Lloyd Price. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's a true story, which is right. Kind of he he's like this mythic black figure, Stagger Lee, and the, like mm-hmm. I was shocked to to discover that this tale, this legend of Stag Lee, Stag R. Lee, Stagger Lee, however you want to say it, Stag goes back Lee. more than a century. <laughs> it's like based on a real person who, yeah. who was in a violent incident from 1895, 1895 and they're singing about him. So, yeah. He yeah. shot somebody. <laughs> What'd you say, Anita? He stole a hat and he shot somebody. I think in the reverse order, something like that. (laughs) And then the other thing that I learned in looking at the Staggerly song, (laughs) okay, so like we have, we thought hip hop had, you know, the clean version and the dirty version. There are two versions of the Lloyd Price song. And there is the original version, which tells this true story. And there is a bandstand version in which... Stag Lee and Billy are fighting over a girlfriend and Stag Lee doesn't want to be um, not friends with Billy anymore. So he gives him back his money and his girlfriend and they make up. That makes no sense, but I, I heard it. I actually heard it. So <laughs> anyway, so let's talk about the casting. We've already talked about um, how great Jeffrey Wright is. Yes. And you know, this is a this is a role that really, really suits him. And he even said in the press conference that he felt that the, the role was really um suited to him, that he had so many similarities. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 But Tracy Ellis Ross, she wasn't even in the movie that long. That's what I said. Oh. That was my takeaway. That was my takeaway. <laughs> like, what happened? <laughs> what do you mean what happened? No, I mean I'm saying, what happened? Why wasn't she in? Why was it? You, was her you don't remember the story, huh? We don't want to give it away. <laughs> right. We don't. Right. Okay. Yeah. I know what happened to her, but what I was saying is like, I was surprised that her role was so short. And, yeah. But, yeah. you know. Yeah. 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 And but then, just say- okay. then I quick. wondered too that, you know, did, did was that meant to come with, or was it the result of the stress of being the sole, uh, I want to say, I guess, caretaker of their mother, the stress of that, because mm. as we mm. know, that is very stressful when only mm. one of the Absolutely. siblings is in charge of, you know, the mother and everything or whatever else she was going through, her divorce and all of that. Right. And, um, you know, we... we and, that, and that it was the woman, the sister that ended up bearing the brunt of all that. Neither one of the brothers, it was the right. their sister that had to do that, which is kind of a... It's common, and but it's also stereotypical and all that, you know. Right. Yeah. I just want to say that um, uh, to go away, to go back to Issa for a second, the, the the character name of Sinatra Golden is probably one of the all time great character names that he could have possibly come up with. So I thought that was really really funny, um, and it was also great to see Erica Alexander on I screen. I love her. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I mean this. There's oh, there's so much. And even the cinematography, I thought, looked great. Like, when do you see Black folks who, in Massachusetts... On the beach house, yes. The beach two house. homes, yes, yes. right? Yes, yes. Family mm-hmm. of doctors. It yes. just, to me, it looked beautiful. I thought the, the music was, was great. Um, yes. Even even the, the supporting actors... 
well, like his mm -hmm. his um agent. I I don't think I've ever seen that that guy uh, who played his agent in another movie. Maybe I have, but I, I never noticed. Mm -hmm. I have. Yeah, but I don't remember. Um, what, but I, I definitely yeah. remember his face. Yeah. Anita, what, was you said, film, what was yeah? What was the name of the film about um, Hector Laveau? What um, what was that? Oh, film? yeah. Um, he played um, not Tito Puente. Uh, I can't remember the name of the person, but he was in that movie. El Cantante. El Cantante. Yeah, that one. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that was a mess of a film, but <laughs> <laughs> we're not discussing that here. Um, <laughs> you know what, Janine? Too though. One of the things that I thought was really interesting too is, so when we think of black wealth, you know, they have wealth, you know, they were doctors in the family and all that kind of stuff. What I thought was pretty significant was um, Myra's role, you know, she was the housekeeper. When she first comes into the scene, you assume that she's a relative, like, mm -hmm. you know, an aunt or a sister or somebody, but she's the housekeeper and she's mm -hmm. so ingrained in the family that you don't even view her as that. And I guess it made me think too that I never thought of the help as it applies to black wealth and yes. black families. So mm -hmm. I thought that that was interesting pivotal. to show. That was pivotal in the in the scene that came later too, when when uh, the brother was with his his lover or whatever, and uh, and she is the one that embraced him and told mm -hmm. him, you know, yeah. you're not you're not a problem, you're not a whatever, you're your family, you know, yeah. and she and hugs him, and yeah, so. All of that was, like, was very important. It was like she yeah, was in but, charge almost, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She she was the uh, the alternate matriarch of the family, right. and um, mm -hmm. that is that is her role at the end of the movie. Um, I just need to confess that on my second viewing of the film, I really thought more about Monk's character, his. Um, stepping away from his family, being a writer, being so interior, being aloof, mm -hmm. keeping people away, is it, something that I relate to in, in myself. Yeah, um, me too, me too. It really me made too. me rethink, yeah. you know, I, I live with my family, okay? But I'm always fighting for solo time so I can yeah. get in my head and listen yeah. to my music and think about my podcast and do my readings and write what I have to write. And sometimes being a writer, you can't help but separate yourself from people, but sometimes you do tend to miss things or not really respond as well as you could to the outside world. So that's something that really made me reflect. Um, I think there's so many, there's so many creative uh, uh, people especially creative black people that I know who have had that similar journey, whether it be a writer or actor or a singer or whatever, like you, you know, your family is one way, then you leave home to go out and, you know, see the world and pursue the dreams. And you, you don't really set out to really quote unquote distance yourself, but it just happens and you become a bit, you know, distance and you're not as, you know, present. And so you don't know, you know, maybe you forget a birthday, a family member's birthday or a graduation or something like that. Because you're pursuing your own dreams, and so you really you wake up one day and you're like, "Wow, like I kind of, I kind of missed out. Like I am the outsider now, like unintentionally, but I am the outsider." It, exactly. It's the byproduct of being yep. a creative. You know, creative people need need that space and that need time. Space, exactly. Yes. Your vibe, whereas you know everyone else was doctors. He was the one that that had the the different vibe going on, and and so uh, that's what called for that. Yeah. Yeah, and I just I love Sterling K. Brown. I mean. He, he I, the last couple of things I've seen him in, he just goes <laughs> all out <laughs> in his characterization. And <laughs> I loved it. I wondered if, if maybe it was stereotypical, but you know, it, it was a unique character, I thought. And he, and some of those scenes were in, improvised, like some of the ribbing that they did with each other was totally improvised. So. Yeah, I would not say his his character is completely stereotypical because I mean they made him, you know, he 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 did have the flash, uh, and all that, but you know he had some very tender moments and and very you know kind of quiet moments. He wasn't Robin Williams in in the Birdcage, you know? <laughs> but but he did have a couple of uh, well, but remember also he had like he had been like he had he had to make up time like he had been yeah. in a 
in a in a straight relationship. We have you know a wife it, and kids and all that. And he was like, yeah. "This is not this is not even who I am. Let me get out and party right now." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I loved his sentence when he and his brother were in the dining room and they were talking about being doctors and you know prescribing. And he he said to his brother, Monk said, "I'm not that kind of doctor." He's like, you, "We might need you to to revive a sentence." <laughs> yeah yeah so could this movie have been made 10 years ago and could it be could it have been made 10 years from now these are issues historically right that we've been facing in this country of being stereotyped or seen in as a monolith and yeah. all of that right yeah. I, I could have been made I, in the past uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean I, Spike Lee, you know, I, I've I was just about to say that. Right. I was about to say that. Yeah. <laughs> you take over, brother. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's really it. That's it. I mean, you know, I, I didn't feel like it was that revolutionary. I'm just yeah. happy that it was that it was made, you know, that it was made now. Yeah, it could have been made before, but I'm so so happy that we're having these kind of movies now, you know, that are layered and, and intelligent and thoughtful, still funny, still sexy, all that. Mm -hmm. and, and I always look at to she's got to have it as kind of opening the door for mm -hmm. us to, mm -hmm. to, to, be, to have real characters uh, that are flawed and, and multifaceted and and but still incredibly compelling, you know, that, you know, and not stereotypical, you know, mm -hmm. that. Uh, that you know, sitting in the theater yesterday, I was just so I had this really warm feeling that it's just great that we could have a movie like this, you know, that I get to have one of these this Christmas because I can't tell you how many Christmases there weren't any movies like this for us. Or it'd be, mm -hmm. you know, and I like the best man, but you know, that'd be the, the best man holiday or whatever. And so you oh, got that no. kind of, yeah, it's where's two different the, things, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, this was wonderful at yeah. this time of year and yeah. in this time of life as well just like janine was saying we're all right in this yeah. with yeah. dealing with parents dealing with career dealing with identity dealing with um being taken seriously and, and all those things it just kind of hits you know hit me yeah. in any way in a very Real personal way. place very you know like right now like just it's yeah. just right on time right on time yeah yeah absolutely so thumbs up across the board for from Ab all of us, I would say. Abso Definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Any final thoughts, Anita? Anything that I that you wanted to add? I mean, I'm happy that <laughs> this type of film has been made, but you know, like you had told me, you know, Jeffrey Wright was saying that this film is proof that moving away from black trauma porn. I mean, yeah, that's probably true, but what remains to be seen is whether filmmakers will con will contribute to this as a new trend in filmmaking. It may not be considered new. And whether Ho Hollywood executives are actually going to fund something like this. Mm. You know, this is the second type the second film that I've seen related to book publishing. The other one is not like a um, major film, but it's actually on a streaming platform called The Other Black Girl. And that is about book publishing, too. But it turns out to be like a cult where Black girls, well, using um, hair grease as a metaphor, is used in this cult to get Black women to stop complaining about how tough it is for them in the industry. So in order to be successful, you rub this grease in your head and you, you know, you become different. Wow. So mm -hmm. I don't know... Amen. How it's yeah. gonna work, and and even with the bidding, with the um the amount of money that um he got, that Monk got for the film, Zakia Harris wrote the book, which um this the other black girl adaptation is adapted to, um the other black girl, she got paid one million dollars for this, okay, and she was able to have it like Monk turned into you know, a film. In her case, it's a streaming episode on Hulu. But it's like, okay, so this is where we are now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's going to, my final thought would be, it's going to be very telling what the first week box office um, mm -hmm. is for the film. And that'll probably, you know, 
we'll be we'll be able to see will there be more American fictions made or will this be just like a kind of you know a one off situation? Um, but I think that um, I think there's definitely going to be in the Oscar race without a doubt, um, and oh, I think yeah. that's gonna that's gonna to like yeah. that's gonna you know you know shine a spotlight on on the fact that because this reminded me I, I agree with everything that Scott said earlier about when I sat down and after after the lights came up at the screening. I immediately thought of the first time I saw, like you said, Spike Lee's She's Gotta Have It. That's what, it was like, it was different. It was unexpected. It was something you were like, wow, I've never, I never thought that I would see a movie like this. And this was kind of what I, my reaction when I left the theater um, last week for this one too. So we'll see. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I, I actually showed it to my mother. She loved wow. it. My wow. mother is eighty. How old is my mother? Well, she's in her 80s. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> and she got so much out of it. So, you know, we'll see. So everybody go see it, support American fiction, and hopefully we'll see it represented in the race because I was so disappointed. Was it last year or the year before when Woman King got totally overlooked? And I thought mm. that was a fantastic movie also, but I digress. So there's certainly other movies out as we come into you know the end of the year. And I think the other movie that I know Derek and I have talked about and um, really got a big buzz because directed by Martin Scorsese, who is a major filmmaker, which is Killers of the Flower Moon. And I talked somewhat about it on my last podcast. I just was running my mouth about a bunch of different topics, but... It is a major film achievement, no doubt. You, It is a film about um, basically in 1920s Oklahoma, sort of the, what would you say, the abuse, the swindling, the decimation of- All of, the, the, all of that, yes. Of the yeah. Osage tribe yeah. who yeah. had become enriched when oil was discovered on their land and- <laughs> Also, also in a in a state, mind you, not too far away from where the Tulsa, you know, Black yeah. Wall Street massacre mm -hmm. happened. So that's what we're the, Which that was part happened. of. Yeah. Yes. And they had a. Yeah. Yeah, and so you even see a scene in the movie where they're looking at um, th there's people in the movie theater, and I think at that point it was still silent films. They hadn't even um, switched to talkies yet. But they are showing a newsreel reporting on uh, the Tulsa massacre, and the Osage are like, "Are are we next? You know, are we next? Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah." So, so, Derek, how did how did the film leave you? Strike you? Well, can we just? I mean, you know, listen. I don't consider myself as <laughs> the film critic per se, I, I like movies. So I go to see movies, um, but I'm always like, cause I have such a uh, short attention span sometimes. And so when I see three and a half hours before I even go in, I'm like nervous. I'm like, how am I gonna get through this? And I gotta say, it just kind of goes by as a, as, a, as a sweeping, breathtaking story that you can follow from beginning to end. And the way it's shot is so, beautiful and the performances are so beautiful and i was fully engaged from the opening credits to that last scene which is so powerful with the with the indian nation uh the ritual the burial ritual happening i thought it was just phenomenal i thought it was absolutely phenomenal so i understand all the high praise that it's getting and you know what it's martin scorsese and you know you can't go wrong with martin scorsese so yeah. right i, I i'm that's interesting because i'm telling you i felt my life pass before my eyes as i was watching this movie it just went on and on and on yeah. and I think um y y you know you have white characters who are s basically pretending to be um friendly with supporting caring, caring, us, yeah. mm -hmm. embedded into um the the Osage tribe and they're all doing all this skull, they're lying to these people's faces and it's just so blatant mm -hmm. and violent that mm -hmm. it, it kind of made me um, sink down in my seat. 
So by the time that the film gets to the point of retribution, where there is an FBI agent that comes out to investigate all the deaths, uh, you know, the mysterious deaths of Osage Indians, I was just like, how can this be made right? There, there is no, there is no justice. Yes, right. they can imprison these people, they can stop them in their tracks, but the serious damage has been done. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the story, and also I was confused by Leonardo DiCaprio's character because he is the main character who weds an Osage woman and has children with her, is part of the family, claims to love her, and yet is an agent in his uncle's schemes and plans to basically wipe out the yeah. entire He's family. He's totally corrupted by the by the uncle, by Robert De Niro. Totally corrupted by it. Because I don't I don't think when he arrived from wherever he came from, I don't think I don't think his I think he was a good person when he got off the the the, the train initially. Right. I don't I don't think he came to like, you know, be the evil bastard that he turned out to be in the movie. Uh but Robert De Niro is just so hateful in the movie that it's just like, ugh, it just made me cringe. Yes. It's it's cringeworthy. And but it's also a chapter in American history that people need to be aware of. They, and that and that that's the point of the movie, exactly, exactly. It, people don't because I didn't know that story. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that, I didn't I didn't know know that story. Yeah, there's but, just so many different kinds of stories to to be told, and 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 uh, to the point earlier about you know there there are movies like American Fiction that I I can see. I, I can see myself seeing that another five times, you know, but that Casey movie was uh, a good one and done for me because um, that's true. That's true. It, it's yeah. just so heart wrenching how evil, you know, the, the white folks in that movie uh, did the, the Osage Indians. Uh, and, I mean, you know, from the lying to their face to actually killing them. And I mean, when they took homegirl, you know, and she's saying, you know, you guys go kill me, you go kill me. And she's all drunk and they just, you know, it's just so heartless, you know, and, and the world that we live in today has enough BS that we're, that we're all dealing with, you know, here and abroad that, you know, a movie like that is just, it's a history lesson, a very well done one, you know, it was long. I agree with Janine. It, 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 you know, it was a long time to be dealing with evil, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. just so, yeah, yeah, one, one and done for that. But yeah, yay, Scorsese, you know, I think he's, you know, it was one he, he apparently been wanting to make for a very long time. And uh, so I'm, I'm glad that he was able to do that. And people do need to see it yes. one time because it's a part of history that as we mentioned, people don't know about. But for us as people of color, it ain't new. It ain't, it right. ain't new to us. It's or not surprising. A right, right, right. Right. <laughs> That's you the Jeffrey Wright dealing with the white student in the class at the beginning of America. <laughs> yeah. 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 I haven't seen the film and it's for some of the reasons that you both that all of you pointed out. I mean, the three and a half hours it was that. And I really mm. was really ready. And then I was like, wow, that's three and a half hours. That's long. But then I read about it. You know, I read some of the reviews and everything. And I was like, oh, my God, this is going to be another story of death and greed and all of that. And I was like, and that gave me pause, actually. But I still am planning to go see it because it's history. And I like movies that are nonfiction so I can learn something new. But I was like, man, I don't know if I'm going to be able to take it right now. <laughs> and Lily Gladstone Understood. is awesome in it. Yeah. And yeah. just to move on to another movie, but carrying that point forward of, you know, our pain at how we are treated in this country, um, I got to see Ava DuVernay's Origin, um, mm. which is basically a movie about the journey that... Um, the author uh, Isabel Wilkerson takes. It's like her personal, physical, emotional journey to writing the book Cast, which is basically about, she um, proposes that racism is a byproduct of this idea of caste, of a hierarchical society that happens all over the world. And, um, 
that movie got heavy. And honestly, when I started to watch it, I wasn't, I didn't really know what it was about. I, honestly, I just knew it was Ava DuVernay and um, my girl is in it, uh, the actress, um, Anjali Ellis, mm -hmm. who I have to love. Mm -hmm. And the, the, er, the first scene is a young boy, you know, he's talking on the phone, he's walking the street in suburbia, he goes into, you know, the local 7-Eleven or whatever the store is, and as soon as he puts down a drink and a pack of Skittles on the counter, I'm like, oh no, oh no, this is a Trayvon Martin story. I, mm. I don't know, I don't know if I could do this. It's too painful, I don't know if I could watch this movie. But as mm -hmm. it continued on, it, the point of view switched to Isabel Wilkerson hearing about that incident and being asked to write about it. And then the story just went from there. But it goes to our ongoing trauma of always being exposed to these stories. Yes, we feel for these very real incidents of brutalization and victimization and racism, in this country, but and we're not denying that, but it's hard to keep being beat by it and seeing the images all the time. But I do recommend the movie. Yeah. Mm, yeah. 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 It's a good movie because it's also about her relationships and her process, her writing yeah. process of how she does her research and connects the dots. So, mm. but, but there was a point in the movie where I thought, why why like it's painful like in you know killers of the flower yeah. moon you get to a point in the movie like why does this keep happening why lord why so yeah i've read i i haven't seen the movie but i have read a couple articles that are about how it is powerful but for what for, for whatever reason the initial screenings it doesn't appear to be connecting to audiences and i think because that because i was because I, I saw the trailer several months ago and i was like wow i want to see this and now that it's out like i don't hear much you know, it was, it's been passed over for all the awards so far. It hasn't gotten noticed on anything, which is surprising to me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So maybe it's too much for people. Yeah, possibly. You know, because it, it doesn't just talk about our trauma as Black people. It talks about um, Jewish survivors of the Holocaust. It talks okay. about the caste system in India. Mm. Um, it talks about oppression in numerous situations and that gets really heavy because, you know, we have our own burdens to bear, but so do so many others. Right. Okay. Right. All right. right. So moving on, um, is anybody excited about the color purple? I want, I want to see it. I don't know if I'm excited about it. I want I'm to not. see it. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about black trauma. Y'all are cruel. <laughs> Y'all are cruel today. Wow. No, no, no. <laughs> I've seen it many times, obviously. I saw it when it came out when I was uh, much younger. I saw it on Broadway. And quite honestly, I kind of had enough. Mm. I was <laughs> enough, with the, enough with the color purple. <laughs> I mean that, that that is a story that has come so full circle, and and I'm one of those people that'll probably lose my black pass because I've never watched the Color Purple original one all the way through. I, I've never been able to get through it. I did not read the book, of course. I did not see it on Broadway, and the only thing that I'm slightly interested in with this new one is the casting and the fact that my girl Brenda Russell was involved in in writing the songs for this right, one. Right. Yeah. yeah, so uh, but you no, know, excited. It, there's there's like twelve movies. It's been a long time that there's been this many movies that I want to see, uh, in, in this holiday season when I usually do see a lot of movies. And so, um, it's not really on the list unless I get through everything else, and then it's like, oh, okay, let me check this out. But that's wow. just more. I've <laughs> never been able to really get behind that. I couldn't get through the first one. Couldn't get through it. Wow. Get out. <laughs> you are rejected. No. My black. No, I mean, Scott, can I? Can yeah, I go ask, ahead. Scott, could I ask you where you stopped in the film? It, it's been so long ago uh, when I tried, when I watched, and again, I was, I was, of course, much younger. Um, I, you know, I just, I think I really was bristled at, at the, uh, the, the way you know, about the men in this, in that, in that story. 
And uh, I, I just, you know, I didn't have the patience that I might have now. I mean, I almost feel like I need to see, you know, make myself sit and watch the original and then compare it with the new one. That would be the, the me of old that would just kind of make it a personal assignment. But uh, this is not a good time for that because I've got everything from Wonka to Godzilla to Rustin to, I mean, there's so many things I need to see. So that that one's just not speaking to me. <laughs> I understand. I saw it. And I know that the original 1985 movie, it, it's a classic, you know, it's widely beloved. And then they turned it into a stage musical, which I didn't see. Now I love Brenda Russell, that's my girl. Stephen Bray, the late mm -hmm. Alan Willis, brilliant. But yes. this, this film is, is about female empowerment, but it takes so long to get to her moment of empowerment. And meanwhile, mm. again, we're dragged through all this trauma and sexual and physical abuse, dysfunction, deprivation, jail, all this stuff. It's just tough to take. And then, mm. like, the music. Now, like I said, I love those writers. <laughs> I didn't find the music to be, you know, every, okay, this is like, this is what I wrote, like, in my notes, you know. The, the film has foot stomping gut bucket blues numbers, foot stomping spirited gospel numbers, foot stomping anthems <laughs> full of deep southern spirit, and a whole lot of foot stomping head snapping choreography to go with it. But it's all like, <clears throat> okay, I, I already said too much. Like, my they're going to come for my black card too. I love Fantasia. I love the, the casting. I, I didn't really <laughs> necessarily want Taraji. Tends them to be, you know, the uh, should. Yeah, yeah. But, okay, some people are going to love this movie. More power to them. It's beautifully shot, beautifully produced. Go with God. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Oprah is going to be mad at you. No, tell us I, know. You I know. I'm sorry, Oprah. <laughs> oh, Lord, maybe I should edit this out. Okay? <laughs> Oprah's going to be <laughs> Yeah, you don't want to make any enemies. <laughs> Go, go. Under your movie seat, and there's gonna be a buy. Everybody else gets, you know, some 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 cookware or a new book or something. And Janine's seat's gonna have a Wiley Coyote bomb, right? A Wiley <laughs> Oprah bomb under. It. <laughs> I get I get the injection seat basically is what happens. Can I mention my Can I mention my favorite movie? Go ahead. My favorite movie of the year. I, mean, I love American Fiction was my second favorite movie. My favorite movie of the year is Maestro. I saw Ooh. Maestro. I saw my show about three weeks ago, um, and I was, when I say blown away by Bradley Cooper's performance, like blown away. Like the script is fantastic, but he is so in this character that you forget it's him. Like from beginning mm -hmm. to when uh, Leonard Bernstein is a is an older man, um, the script is brilliant. Like I said, Carrie Mulligan as the uh, as the wife is great. Sarah Silverman, who I never even thought was a, as an actor, is really really good as his as his sister. And it's his shot it's it, it's shot both in black and white for the first half, and then and they switched to color um, toward the end. Um, and it's just like a it's two hours of, of 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 solid solid filmmaking. And I wouldn't be surprised if I think Bradley is probably going to get the um, like he's going to get nominated for sure for like Oscar. But I wouldn't be surprised if he gets it because he's so deserving. Um, it's just a great movie. I That's another it. one on my list to see. Yeah, I it's saw it yesterday. I, wow! I, I watched it yesterday, and it is towering achievement. I would say, um, he he does embody Leonard Bernstein, and and of course Leonard was a maestro of our generation. If I mean, if you you knew who he was, he was a public figure. He didn't just stick to classical music. He was also a composer. He did Broadway. Um, you know, he is well known. And uh, West Side Story and Candide mm -hmm. is another musical that I happen to love. Did we know this much about his personal life? No, we didn't. And that's what made it um, really, really interesting. And he's a fascinating character because he had so many dichotomies uh, about his personal life and his his drive and his um imagination 
I do think you need to know a little bit about who he is. Like there, we may know who he is, but mm -hmm. there are going to be people who will come into the movie who will be like, I have no idea who these people are. I don't know what's happening. What mm -hmm. are they saying? Because you get dropped right into his world. Mm -hmm. And there's That's a true. party scene and it's all this rat-a-tat talk and, and famous names are being thrown around. So that yeah. might confuse you, mm -hmm. um, but st stick with it. Stick with it. And um, as I was telling Anita, like because of the of the times that it was set in, everybody smoked cigarettes. Now, I'm a former cigarette smoker myself. But this movie is going to give you lung cancer. <laughs> Just watch it, it, it. Seriously, am I wrong, Jared? No, for real. It was it was a it was a smoky movie for sure. <laughs> but I love, and also because there were certain there were certain little fantasy elements to it, right? Like. Oh my gosh! It, it's and, just... and the and the fact that he did, I mean it's it's so mind boggling that you could act, write, and direct yourself like that to that much perfection. I was just mm -hmm. like it's, I was I was blown away. Yeah, I mm. feel like Bradley Cooper is like he's turning into like this polymath who you know everything. You know what? The other thing is I somehow I saw a YouTube video of him. This was years ago. I forget that disco era movie he was in where they were um American Hustle. Yes. No, yeah, yeah, American Hustle, yes. Yeah, Hustle, yeah, yeah American yeah. Hustle, which was which was a good movie, really entertaining. Yeah. But yeah. he did a interview in France. He was on a French talk show and I thought he was gonna have an interpreter. He just busted out and starts talking in perfect French. And I don't know why that impresses me, but <laughs> I'm like, this dude is brilliant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's awesome. Yeah, awesome. it's a good movie. I, I recommend yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what else is on our list as we Rusty. wind down? Uh, the whole, the, the, I, I can get myself out of the way real quick. I, you know, uh, because of me moving away from two hours away from Hollywood and all of that to a place that doesn't have a whole lot of movies, I didn't see many. So the only other one that uh, now that, you know, from now, American Fiction is my favorite movie. Uh, of the year, but before I saw that yesterday, it was Executioner Three. I mean, or no, what, 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 what? what uh, none of uh, Denzel. What's that movie? Oh, oh Equalizer um, Three. Equalizer. Equalizer. Equal yeah. I did something wrong. Yeah, Equalizer Three. I really enjoyed that. I love seeing Denzel in Italy. You know, saving the little town and and just being a badass and all that. It was total popcorn movie. And uh, and I enjoyed it, but like I said, I have a good baker's dozen of movies to see within the next couple of weeks, and I'm so happy with the bumper crop. So yeah, I think all I've seen this year was you know Killers of the oh. Yellow Moon, uh, the Denzel movie, and now American Fiction. So I'm really behind, <laughs> and I used to do a lot more stuff. This just wasn't the year for that until now. Yeah. The other film that I, I think is um, Oscar worthy, I, I, I hope it gets attention, but it doesn't seem to be generating much, is Rustin, mm -hmm. uh, which George C. Wolfe directed. And I, I thought it was a little um, stagey in like it seemed. Yeah, like I play. can see. Yeah, I, I would just jump in and just say, like, I liked it. I didn't love it. And the problem with George C. Wolfe is just what you said. Same problem with Mar Rainey's Black Bottom. He directs stuff as if you're on Broadway, and this is not Broadway. This is a film you're going to see. And so I, and I also felt that, and I love Coleman Domingo. Don't get me wrong. I love, I love him. But I, I felt that, I felt that he was acting in most of the scenes. I, I felt that he's good. Don't get me wrong. He's good. But I'm like, eh, I don't know. So I wanted to like I didn't him more. get that. Yeah, I totally got it. Yeah. Mm, I thought he he was amazing. Like he had these. Obviously, he was not speaking in his own cadence. Like he really had to adopt. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this was a real life figure who orchestrated the march on Washington. Like he, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. he, like um, because of rumors about his sexuality and his mm -hmm. his um, relationships, he kind of got drummed out of the NAACP. And mm -hmm. he only cried about it for like two minutes, and he turned around. Okay, well, I'm going to start this march on Washington. I'm going to uh, recruit people to help me set it up and we're going forward. And he was able to get back 
all of the, uh, you know, the, the civil rights leaders at that time. He was able to face down the Washington naysayers who were trying to block having this. Uh, two, he wanted it to be a two day event. And they said, no, you can only have a one day event. He's like, all right, right we'll right, have a one day right, event. You know, right, right. It, it was awesome. It, it is a great story that I don't think has been told before. And I would really like to see Coleman get get his um, attention because he's been working for a while, too. But we're yeah, just yeah. starting to really yeah. notice him. Really good movie. Um, Anita, anything else on your list? Um, like Scott, I have a list. <laughs> <laughs> that you have to get. Because really, this year, all I saw was, uh, I well... In the movies, it was Equalizer 3 as well. I saw that in the summer, American Fiction. So now that's obviously my favorite movie now. Um, I want to see, I've got to go to see Killers of the Flower Moon. I have to do that. Um, okay. Maestro, I need to see as well. Because again, I like nonfiction. So it's, yeah. teach, it's teaching me something. I definitely want to go and see it. Yeah, it's, it's a great film. And as great as he is, um, Bradley Cooper, um, Carrie Mulligan it is amazing. It's just yeah, she's good. I love her. She's good. She's really good. The other film that I'm going to mention is May, December, which is getting a lot of, um, oh, yeah. talk uh, and attention, particularly before the script. And I actually, they actually sent me a bound copy of the script. So I think I'm going to look at the script because the movie kind of left me a little bit cold. It's kind of like a reimagining or a jumping off of the facts of the Mary Kay Letourneau case where she um, was a teacher who fell in love with a 13 year old and ended up going to prison for it. And then she, you know, she comes out of prison, marries the guy and they now they're having their suburban life and an mm. actress is going to portray her in an upcoming movie. And so she comes to do research and talk to this woman. And it's just so both of these characters are so like they're a little left to center they're a little a little weird and i think that's where the director todd ames likes to go yeah. um, these characters so yeah i told so May, you December. Mm -hmm. i told you i couldn't get through it i couldn't get through the first 15 minutes oh um, wow i know the wow. story you know yeah. you've seen it on lifetime you've seen it on whatever you know the the um you know, the specials that they do, yeah. On you know, on any network. And it was just like, oh God, no, not this again. Yeah, that, was that, that woman is seriously it. deluded. Like she's seriously yeah. deluded still, you know? And particularly as she's portrayed in this movie, she has a different name. Her, na her name is Gracie. She's not Mary Kay. Right. Um, and the young man, it's Julianne Moore. And the young man who plays her husband is, uh, his name is Charles Melton. He was in... The Sun is also a star, which was kind of like a teen romance with Yara Shahidi a couple of years ago. He's getting all the up. buzz. He's getting all the buzz for um, supporting actor awards. Yes. Uh, Charles. Yeah. 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 He's on the come up. So, um, but yeah, I don't know. It, it kind of left me a little cold. Um so yeah, maybe we'll leave it there. I have other movies that I could talk about because you know, I've seen so many movies just in the last two, three weeks trying to catch mm. up and, um, you know, be prepared to vote in whatever voting I'll be doing. Have you seen um, The Holdovers? I have seen The Holdovers. Oh, I can't wait to see that. Okay. Oh, yeah. It, it was interesting. It was an interesting movie. And I love that actor, that sideways guy. Paul, Paul, Paul Giamatti. Paul, yeah. Paul Giamatti. He, yeah. he is... Unbelievable. But the woman Divine Joy Randolph. Yeah, she's yes. getting all she's she's getting all the buzz. Yeah. yeah. She her character is so refreshing because wow. she she I feel like she looks stereotypical. Like she's a she's a big mm -hmm. black woman That's working true. in the kitchen of this um of this uh school, you know, this private school, boys school. But she there's so many layers to her. There's so many layers to her, and um, I can't. I can't wait to see it. I cannot wait to see this one. Yeah, yeah, it it's good. Another okay. movie that I, I would talk about. A couple of other movies I mentioned is Past Lives, which is coming mm. in for the um, foreign language, even though it's 
half in English and half in Korean. Mm. It is so beautiful to look at. Wow. Oh my God, the cinematography is awesome. And it's just heartrending because it's about a love that couldn't be, couldn't be, just could not be. And it just makes you, it, it, it'll make you think about all your past romances and <laughs> your missed opportunities, <laughs> the people who wanted to be with you that you didn't want to be with, <laughs> the people you wanted to be with who weren't wow. with you. And then those just moments of awkwardness, of what, like when you're with somebody and, so, you know, like there's all this unspoken yearning and lust and, oh, it's so good. Mm -hmm. Oh. And the other one is um, boom, 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 is um, you Can hurt you my feelings. You hurt mm -hmm. my feelings, which is a Nicole Holofcener film. Yeah. And basically, mm -hmm. at its core, it's about thinking of exploring the idea of how many times we shore up our family members, our friends, those we love. You're great, honey. You're a great writer. You are a fantastic. If you did it, it's wonderful. Don't worry about it. You're fantastic. <laughs> Keep doing it. Even when we might go to ourselves, you know what? They, they're not that good. They're not that good. <laughs> but you know what? You keep doing you. It's, it's so good. Julia, Julia Louis-Dreyfus is, is, you know, she's amazing in it. So I guess we can wrap up there. This has been a fantastic conversation. I really enjoyed having you guys on. Thank you so much. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy yeah. holidays, everybody. And Janine, thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Anita, you gonna be on again. <laughs> <laughs> You're joining the Words on Flicks team. <laughs> So okay. I'm okay with that. Okay, good. Scott, so happy to see you. Good Happy's to see you. Years. Nice to meet you, Derek. I've heard all about you. Awesome yeah. to meet you too. Yeah. All right, guys. Oh. I appreciate right. y'all oh. to the max. Oh.